We'll start the story. Tonight's story is called The Tailor of Gloucester by Beatrix Potter. In the time of swords and periwigs and full-skirted coats with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold-laced waistcoats of paduasoy and taffeta, there lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westgate Street, cross-legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snippered it and pierced out his satin and pompadour and lute string and stuffs, all the things with strange names that were very expensive in the days of the tailor of Gloucester. But although he sewed the fine silk for his neighbours, he himself was very poor, very, very poor. He had no money. A little old man in, spe in spectacles with a pinched face and old crooked fingers and a suit of threadbare clothes. Threadbare means you could see the threads uh, of the clothes and the, the cloth has come off. It's going to fall to bits soon. He cut his coats without waste, according to his embroidered cloth. They were very small ends and snippets that lay about on his table. Two narrow breadths for naught, except waistcoats for mice, said the tailor. One bitter cold day near Christmas, the tailor began to make a coat, a coat of cherry colored corded silk embroidered with pansies and roses and a cream-coloured satin waistcoat trimmed with gauze and green worsted chenille for the mayor of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked and he talked to himself. He measured the silk and he turned it round and round and trimmed it into shape with his shears. The table was all littered with cherry-coloured snippets. No breadth at all and cut on the cross. It is no breadth at all. Snippets for mice and ribbons for mobs for mice, said the tailor of Gloucester. When the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes and shut out the light, the tailor had done his day's work. All the silk and satin lay cut out on the table. There were twelve pieces for the coat and four pieces for the waistcoat. And there were pocket flaps and cuffs and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat, there was a fine yellow taffeta and for the buttonholes of the waistcoat, there was a cherry-coloured twist. And everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient, except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry-coloured silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark, for he did not sleep there at nights. He fastened the window and locked the door why, and took away the key. Why, why lock the door? So nobody could go in. Oh, I see. No one lived there at night but little brown mice and they run in and out without any keys. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester there are little mouse staircases and secret trap doors and the mice run from house to house through those long narrow passages. They can run all over the town without going into the streets. But the tailor came out of the shop and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite nearby in College Court next to the doorway to College Green. And although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called Simpkin. Now, all day long while the tailor was out at work, Simpkin kept house by himself. And he was also fond of the mice, although he gave them no satin for their coats. That's Simpkin the cat. Meow, said the cat when the tailor opened the door. Meow. The tailor replied, Simpkin. We shall make our fortune, but I am worn to a ravelling. Take this groat, which is our last fourpence, and Simpkin, 
take a china pipkin, buy a penny worth of bread, a penny worth of milk, and a penny worth of sausages, and O Simpkin, with the last penny of four, our fourpence, of our fourpence, buy me one penny worth of cherry coloured silk. But do not lose the last penny of the fourpence, Simpkin, or I'm, I am undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. Then Simpkin said, Meow, and took the groat, that's fourpence, and the pipkin, and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth and talked to himself about that wonderful coat. I shall make my fortune to be cut by us. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning, and he hath ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta, and the te taffeta sufficeth. sufficeth. There is no more left over in the snippets that then will serve to make tippets for the mice. Then the tailor started, for suddenly, interrupting him from the dresser at the other side of the kitchen, came a number of little noises. Tip, tap, tip, tap, tap, tip, tip, tap, tip, tap. Now what can that be? said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered with crockery and pipkins, willow plates and teacups and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening and peering through his spectacles. Again, from under a teacup came those funny little noises. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap. This is very peculiar, said the tailor of Gloucester. And he lifted up the, tip, the teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little live lady mouse and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands and mumbling to himself. The waistcoat is cut from the peach-coloured satin, tambour stitch and rosebuds in beautiful floss silk. Was I wise to entrust my last fourpence to Simkin? One and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured twist. But all at once from the dresser there came another little noise. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap, tip tap, tip tap. This is passing extraordinary, said the tailor of Gloucester. And he turned over another teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little gentleman mouse and made a bow to the tailor. And then from all over the dresser came a chorus of little tappings, all sounding together and answering one another like watch beetles in an old worm-eaten window shutter. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap and out from under the key teacups and from under the bowls and basins stepped other, more little mice who had hopped down and away off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down close to the fire, lamenting, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured silk to be finished by noon on Saturday, and this is Tuesday evening. Was it right to let loose those mice? Undoubtedly the property of Simpkin. Yes, Simpkin's going to be crossed, the, the cat we cross. A lack I'm undone, for I have no more twist. The little mice came out again and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They whispered to one another about the taffeta lining and about the mouse tippets. And then all at once they all ran away together down the passage, behind the wainscot, squeaking and calling to one another as they ran from house to house. And not one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen when Simkin came back with a pipkin of milk. Simpkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry growl, like a cat that is vexed, for he hated the snow, and there was snow in his ears and snow in his collar and snow on the back of his neck. He put down the loaf and the sausages upon the dresser and sniffed. Simpkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simpkin set down the pipkin of milk upon the dresser and looked suspiciously at the teacups. He wanted his supper of a fat little mouse. Simpkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simpkin hid a little parcel privately in the teapot and spit and growled at the tailor. And if Simpkin had been asked to talk, he would have said, where is my mouse? Alack, I'm undone, said the tailor of Gloucester and went sadly to bed. All that night long, Simpkin hunted and searched through the kitchen, peeping under the cupboards, and under the wainscot and into the teapot where he had hidden that twist. But still he never found a mouse. 
Whenever the tailor muttered and talked in his sleep, Simpkin said, Meow! and made strange, horrid noises as cats do at night. For the poor tailor was very ill with a fever. Tossing and turning in his four-post bed, and still in his dreams he mumbled, No more twist, no more twist. All that day he was ill, and the next day and the next. And what should become of the cherry-coloured coat? In the tailor's shop in Westgate Street, the embroidered silk and satin lay out upon the table, one and twenty buttonholes. And who should come to sew them? When the window was barred and the door was locked, who, indeed, who do you think came to sew them? I don't know. Let's see. But that does not hinder the little brown mice. They run in and out without any keys through all the houses of Gloucester. Out of doors, the market folks went trudging through the snow to buy their geese and turkeys and to bake their Christmas pies. But there would be no Christmas dinner for Simpkin and poor old tailor of Gloucester. The tailor lay ill for three days and nights. Then it was Christmas Eve, and very late at night, the moon climbed up over the roofs and chimneys and looked down upon the gateway into College Court. There were no lights at the windows, nor any sound in the houses. All the city of Gloucester was fast asleep under the snow. And still Simpkin wanted his mice, and he mewed as he stood beside the four-poster bed. But it is in the old story that all beasts can talk in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the morning. Although there are very few that can hear them or know what it is that they say. Did you know that, Aidan? All beasts can talk between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. What? All beasts can talk. What? All beasts can talk between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Like cats Beast? or dogs. Beast can be a cat, dog, cow, donkey. donkey. Any animal you like, they can talk. Huh? They can talk between, between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I didn't know that. What? When the cathedral struck twelve, there was an answer like an echo of the chimes. And Simpkin heard it and came out of the tailor's door and wandered about in the snow. From all the roofs and gables and old wooden houses in Gloucester came a thousand merry voices singing the old Christmas rhymes. All the songs that I ever heard of, and some that I don't know, like Whittington's Bells. First and loudest, the cocks cried out, Dame, get up, bake your pies. Oh, dilly, dilly, dilly. Oh, dilly, 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 sighed Simkin. And now in the garret, there there were lights and sounds of dancing, and cats came from all over the way. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle. All the cats in Gloucester except me, said Simkin, talking like a human. Under the woman, wooden eaves, the starlings and sparrows sang of Christmas pies. The jackdaws woke up in the cathedral tower, and although it was in the middle of the winter and the middle of the night, the throstles and robins sang. The air was quite full of twittering tunes, but it was all rather provoking to poor hungry Simpkin. He was provoked by the sound of birds that he likes to eat, particularly he was vexed with some little shrill voices from behind the wooden lattice. I think they were bats. They were, They always have very small voices, especially in a black frost. But they talk in their sleep like the tailor of Gloucester. They said something mysterious that sounded like Buzz quoth the blue fly, hum quoth the bee. Buzz and hum they cry and so do we. And Simpkin went away, shaking his ears as if he had a bee in his bonnet. From the tailor's shop in Gloucester, in Westgate Street, came a glow of light. And when Simpkin crept up to peep in at the window, it was full of candles. There was a surprising noise 
It was the snippeting of singers and the snappeting of thread, and little mouse voices sang loudly and loudly and gaily. Four and twenty tailors went to catch a snail. The best man amongst them does not touch her tail. She put out her horns like a little guy, look how. Run, tailors, run, or she'll have you all in now. Then, without a pause, the little mouse voices went on again. Sieve my lady's oat milk, grind my lady's flour, put it in a chestnut, let it stand an hour. Mew, mew, interrupted Simpkin as he scratched at the door. But the key was under the tailor's pillow, and he could not get it. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my fine little men? Making coats for my gentlemen. Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. Mew, mew, cried Simpkin. Hey, diddle dinkity, answered the little mice. Hey, diddle dinkity, poppity pet, the merchants of London, they wear scarlet. They wear scarlet, silk in the collar and gold in the hem, so merrily march the merchant men. They clicked their thimbles to mark the time, but none of the songs pleased Simpkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop. And then I bought a pip. And a podkin, a slipkin, and a slopkin, all for one farthing. And upon the kitchen dresser, add the rude little mice. Mew, mew, scratch, scratch, scuff, tip, tip, simkin on the window sill, while the little mice inside sprang to their feet and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices. No more twist, no more twist, and they barred up the window shutters and shut out Simkin. But still through the nicks of the shutters he could hear the chuckle, the click of thimbles and the little mouse voices singing, No more twist, no more twist. Simpkin came away from the shop and went home, considering in his mind. He found the poor tailor without fever, sleeping peacefully. Then Simpkin went on tiptoe, took out a little parcel of silk out of the teapot and looked at it in the moonlight. And he felt quite ashamed of his badness compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing he saw upon the patchwork quilt was a skein of cherry-coloured twisted silk, and beside his bed stood the repentant Simpkin. Alack, I am worn to a ravelling, said the tailor of Gloucester, but I have my twist. The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed, and came out into the street with Simpkin running before him. The starlings whistled on the chimney stacks and the throttles, throstles and robins sang. But they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung in the night, because they can't talk now it's Christmas Day. Alack, said the tailor, I have my twist, but no more strength nor time than will serve to make me one single buttonhole for this is Christmas Day in the morning. The mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon, and where is his cherry-coloured coat? He unlocked the door of his little shop in Westgate Street and Simpkin ran in like a cat that expects something. But there was no one there, not even one little brown mouse. The boards were all swept clean, the little ends of thread and the little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout. There where he'd left left plain cuttings of silk there lay the most beautifulest coat and embroidered satin waistcoat that was ever worn by a mare of Gloucester. There were roses and pansies upon the facings of the coat, and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except one single cherry-coloured buttonhole. And where that buttonhole was wanting, there was pinned a scrap of paper with these little words in teeny winny writing. No more twist. And from then began the luck of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite quite stout and he grew quite rich. 
he made the most wonderful waistcoats for all the rich merchants of Gloucester and for all the fine gentlemen of the country around. Never were seen such ruffles or such embroidered cuffs and lappets. But his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of all. The stitchings on those buttonholes were so neat, so neat, I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches on those buttonholes were so small, so small, they looked as if they had been made by little mice. And that's the end of the story. So did you get the idea of the story? The tailor didn't have enough um, thread to do the last buttonhole and he had everything ready to make, put together, but then he fell ill. And while he was asleep or ill, the mice who he'd saved from under the teacups ran to his shop and put the clothes together and all he had left to do when he got there was one little buttonhole and that was the end of it. So the tailor had a good deed done to him by the mice. And that was your story.